Good morning and welcome, friends and members of St. John Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Randy Meisner, pastor of St. John's in Edmonton, welcoming you to our last pre-recorded service for a while, I think. And uh, we want to again say uh, we're glad you've been able to join us during these last months. But next week we will begin our live services again, Sundays, July 5th, German service at 9 o'clock, and English service at 11. We hope those who are able will be able to join us for worship next week. We gather this fourth Sunday of Pentecost, the season of growth, the season of learning what it means from our Lord Jesus to be the church and to be his witnesses in the world. And we gather this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lasst uns beten. Gnadenreicher Gott, führe uns den Weg der Umkehr, dass wir in deiner Nähe leben finden und von Neuem geboren werden aus dem Wasser der Taufe. Mach uns bereit zum Dienst, dass wir einander dienen in Liebe und einander stärken durch dein Wort. Das bitten wir durch Jesus Christus, das lebendige Wort, eins mit dir und dem Heiligen Geist, Gott von Ewigkeit zu Ewigkeit. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Romans, the sixth chapter. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms, because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends our reading. The Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday of Pentecost is taken from St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Gnade sei mit euch und Friede von Gott, unserem Vater und den Herrn Jesus Christus. Amen. The great evangelist D. L. Moody was once asked if he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and his answer was, yes, but I leak. <laughs> A more profound truth about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives can hardly be spoken. We have recently celebrated three great festivals in our church year, the Ascension of our Lord, Pentecost Sunday, and Trinity Sunday. In each of these festivals, Jesus promises not to leave us alone or unequipped, but to breathe on us, to pour out his spirit upon us, to empower us to do his work on earth. And that is good news in theory. But we know ourselves, don't we? We know that we are weak vessels. We are full of cracks and dents and holes. We are timid, self-absorbed, unfocused, and easily distracted. In short, we know well that, yes, indeed, we leak. And this morning's gospel doesn't do a lot to build up our confidence either, because Jesus says, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. In other words, the spirit of Jesus Christ dwells in and with the Christian And the world looks at the Christian in order to see Christ. The teacher is known through the words and works of the teacher's disciples. We are earthly representatives. We are the embodiment of the one who has sent us. In Corinthians, Paul goes so far as to label us as ambassadors for Christ. That is, Christ's stand-ins in a foreign land. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. Biblically, there can be no doubt that from the moment of our baptisms, we carry the imprint of Christ on our brow, and we carry the image of Christ in our lives. That's what it means to be buried and raised with Jesus. As one well-known hymn puts it, we are Christ's heart, his hands, and voice. No doubt, when we actually stop and think about the implications of all this responsibility, it is overwhelming. How can we, who leak and leak often, expect to bear the very image and imprint of Jesus into our world? How can we bear such a load? How tempting it is, then, to just give up on discipleship. To think to ourselves, you know, I can barely speak up for myself Perhaps Jesus should find another ambassador, after all. And how many misguided sermons have been preached over the centuries by preachers who heap burning coals on our heads and pile upon us burden upon burden. Sermons that may sound like this. Don't you know that you are an ambassador for Christ? Do you know that the only Christ your neighbor will see will be you and your words and your actions? Today, Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. It is time to get your life right. Clean up your act. Put on your Sunday best and get out there and speak and think as if you really do represent Jesus in the world. I don't think sermons like this are helpful because what they do is they turn us inward. And they make discipleship and faithfulness an act of our own willpower. As if our own will is enough. As if our good intentions can do what needs to be done for the kingdom. As if. <laughs> whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Where is the good news in this promise? Where do we find joy instead of a burden in Jesus' words to us today? I think we find them in two places. The first place is that we must remember that long before Jesus spoke these words to us, he knew us. Jesus knows us. Jesus knows us from creation. Jesus knows how badly we leak. 
He made us. He formed us. He died on the cross for our leaky selves, our sin. And so when we are baptized, we are not declared miraculously pure and righteous on that day. We are not magically good enough to bear Jesus' name. Rather, what happens is that we are now covered. We are wrapped up. We are draped and robed in Christ's righteousness alone. Thanks be to God that expectations aren't that we measure up. No. Jesus Christ knows us inside and out. And yet still he calls. Still he sends. Because he promises to abide with us. That's what matters. Not our strengths. Not our failures, not our abilities or shortfalls. Christ's promise is to hold us, to guide us and fill us. This is what makes the church of us. This is what makes us the church. Someone once said, It is a sad but unalterable fact that most people are average. Which leads to the second piece of good news this morning that we hear from Jesus, specifically his words at the end of today's gospel. Jesus gives a rather startling example of the kind of disciples that he's looking for. Listen carefully again as I read. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. A cup of water? Is that it? Aren't disciples supposed to do much, much more than that? Aren't we supposed to be giants of prayer, disciplined spiritual warriors, morally faultless, wonderful preachers, skilled writers, profound debaters, courageous risk takers, overflowing with endless compassion, generous to a fault, patient beyond all measure, eager to sacrifice everything on a moment's notice for the Lord. Aren't these things what a disciple is supposed to be about? Aren't these the traits that make us Christ-like ambassadors? A cup of water, that's nothing. Anyone can do that. A cup of water, Surely Jesus expects more than this from us. A cup of cold water? Yes. Here we have a brilliant example, a brilliant image, actually, deliberately chosen by Jesus. A cup of cold water. With this example, Jesus is taking away all of our excuses, isn't he? All of our good reasons for passing our witness on to someone else that we think is more qualified or better than us. A cup of cold water. Who cannot do this much? Who among us is not gifted enough, skilled enough, called enough to do this much? There are no, Jesus leaves us with no excuses today. Not one. Not one. George Herbert, the Welsh poet and priest once said that a holy life that pleases God is not built on grand sweeping gestures, but on a disciplined attention to the small stuff of daily living. The small stuff of daily living. A cup of cold water? It doesn't get any smaller than that, does it? We hardly think about that. We would never brag about giving such a gift. We would never boast about our great generosity as the glass is offered. A cup of cold water, here is the most basic, the cheapest, the simplest gift imaginable. And yet water is the most constant necessary need we have every day of our lives. So this morning, Jesus redefines the discipline at the root of the word disciple. If you are a Christian, You are robed in Christ. If you are a Christian, you bear his cross. You are marked and identified by that cross. Jesus goes with you constantly, endlessly, hour by hour, moment by moment, 
You bear his name. This is the redefining that Jesus does today. So gone, gone is the definition of a disciple as someone who does great and mighty, publicized, notable, holy things for God. Instead, we hear today about a cup of cold water. Faithfulness in the smallest things, done without applause or praise. This is the discipline behind the word disciple. So I think that I will have failed you this morning as a preacher if I leave you somehow thinking that Jesus wants you to be a better disciple. Because if that is the case, then you will have heard just one more of those do better sermons. Those sermons that are only bad news, really, not good news. What I pray you have heard instead is that in your baptism, the spirit and breath of the risen Lord Jesus Christ lives in you. Can you believe such a thing? Can you accept what Jesus says about you this morning? Can you see yourself as chosen, robed in Christ's righteousness, washed and made new, and then sent out? Can you simply receive this incredibly good news about you? Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. This is not a burden. This is joy. Because it reminds you of this. Christ dwells in you, disciple. Leaks and all. So there is nothing else to do. But remember, discipleship is not a self-improvement project. It is believing what Jesus has done and is doing in you, period. Will you receive what Christ Jesus says about you today? And then go out. Go out in his name to pour that cup of water, to bear witness, leaks and all. You are disciples. You have been chosen. Believe this and go. Because a thirsty world is waiting. A thirsty world is waiting. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You'll now have a time of prayer together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have used prophets, priests, and kings to enter human history. Give us the wisdom to hear your voice in their proclamations, to obey your will, and to give thanks for your daily intervention against all that is evil. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love, Lord God, never gives up. You keep your promises forever. Your faithfulness is our hope and certainty that you are involved in every generation, in every family, in every living soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us to welcome you and the Heavenly Father by welcoming those who speak your word in truth. Open our ears to your word, our hearts to your messenger, our wills to your superior will, and our futures to your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, the world's problems are overwhelming, and we are not able to list every malady, need, or injustice. Be our counselor, and when opportunity to help is evident, give us courage to act. We pray for governments, medical experts, researchers, health care workers, and all who must make difficult decisions every day in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. Grant them all wisdom, insight, and understanding for the sake of all humanity, your beloved children. We pray for those who are infected, those who are recovering, those who cannot be with loved ones, those who are isolated and in quarantine, for those who are overwhelmed by circumstances and anxiety. Come, Lord Jesus, shepherd your flock. May your rod and staff guide us all. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with joy those who have preceded us in the faith, and as we name them in our hearts, we also name aloud all those whom we know with special needs. We remember Ewald, Rupert, and Emma. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer, Der Vater Unsa. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Der Herr segne euch und behüte euch. Der Herr, der Herr lasse sein Angesicht leuchten über euch und sei euch gnädig. Der Herr erhebe sein Angesicht auf euch und gebe euch Frieden. Amen. Again, thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to Rudy Welts and family for these weeks of carefully doing this for us. And uh, we want to say welcome back, everyone, uh, next week to our services, July 5th. God's blessings be with you.